right, ladies and gentlemen, today we have the beautiful Natasha here to, uh, for, for, for us. And um, before we get started, um, click the like button, comment, wherever you see it, just um, support it. Leave us a comment. Um, what do you think? What was your main takeaway uh, from today's session? And Natasha and I, we are friends for a little while now. Natasha, uh, <laughs> lives, in, Natasha lives in Ireland. And um, Natasha, my first question for you is, when people ask you what you do, what's your, what's your answer? Uh, I definitely, I would say, yeah, a composer. Mm -hmm. That would, you know, just, just a composer. I mean, I mainly compose for film, mm -hmm. but I do write music for other stuff as well, like for the concert hall, um, gaming, a whole bunch of stuff. So a, comp a composer would be the main, main thing. I mean, I conduct and perform, but just composer. Composer is the, is the main thing. What, does, main what thing. does it mean to be a com composer? What does a composer do? Oh, it's, you know, it's funny. We, we, when we get together, we have a bit of a laugh because, you know, people think that, you know, composers are like in this room for hours on a day writing music, which is true. Mm -hmm. But a lot of our time is actually, it's, you know, we're talking about the real world. It's getting the work, networking, going to film festivals, um, collaborating. And then also you are the producer as mm -hmm. well as the composer. You've got to produce your own music, you've got to mix your own music, especially the budgets that we have today. Um, and then, yeah, you're in that room as well, writing the music. So it's, we've become, you know, I think we're like the days of Mozart and Beethoven, you know, it's, it's that's people think of composer that way, but now it's, it's technology, it's social media, mm -hmm. um, it's business. Uh, hustling and then it's writing music so, so sometimes you kind of find that the music part ends up a lot smaller than you think what do you, you think know? the percentage is between networking business uh, upkeeping uh, versus actually creating what do you think what the percentage is is it 50 50 uh, 60 or? i would say yeah 50 50 i think 50. it is but I mean, it depends. It's very intense. Like, so I just finished a project now where mm. I literally disappeared for three months because it was a hundred minutes of music. It was an intense, intense oh. amount of work. Yeah. <laughs> Orchestral and stuff. Yeah, it was about almost four months actually. So there's that time. So it's kind of a very, you know, but before that, I was writing before that, but then I had a month where I, or two where it was just very much traveling, lecturing, mm. uh, networking. So it fits and starts. So then for the time when I'm writing, that was pretty much every day for eight to 10 hours a day, you know, yeah. no, no days off. That was intense. So I'd say it throughout the year, it's kind of 50, 50, but it's so, you know, it's so important. The other stuff, the business stuff, the, the self-development, self-improvement, all of that is part of being composer as what, well. What does it, what does it mean? The, the business stuff, what, what exactly, you know, should, should people be prepared when they get into becoming a professional composer? What do you mean by business stuff? Mm. It's a lot of, um, think, well, first of all, I kind of start the very beginning of thinking, you know, who are you? Who do you want to portray to mm -hmm. be? What is your music? What is your style? So, you know, I do talk, think about branding as well. It's like, well, what sort of work do you want to, I mean, do you, you know, you, ha you sort of, and when you're starting off, you have to be careful as well of like, how do I want to portray myself? Because that's the, genre I might get stuck into do mm -hmm. I want to be doing cartoons for example for the rest of my life or do I want to be doing you know cyberpunk electronica you know that kind of thing yeah. you've got to think what do I want to be portrayed at portrayed as because that's the work that will come my way so first of all it's kind of the marketing the branding so the business for me is um the social media the websites um also as well as it's the the well now obviously Pre-COVID and hopefully post-COVID, it's going to all the film festivals. Um, it's the networking, meeting, um, having databases of people that you contact and you keep in contact with. It's Spotify, putting your music out there, mm -hmm. making a video of your music, putting on concerts. I put on, on co uh, concerts as well of my music plus other people's music. Mm -hmm. So that's to me is business. I don't know if it's that, if that's biz if you could say it's business, but then there is the business side of you got to look after your cue sheets, your royalties, your publishing. So really it's a huge kind of skill set that you need mm -hmm. that takes time to develop. And, and where so have you learned that? Do you learn it in, in, did you learn it in uni? How to do the business side of things? 
or, or how did you develop those skills? Um, a little bit. I, I studied film scoring at UCLA, so that's uh, in Los Angeles. Um, and there was a module, a three month module on business, the business mm. side of things. So I, you, but it's so, it's so uh, such a big area and broad area and sometimes complex that three months is just not enough. You have to live it. <laughs> you have to yeah. trial and error, as you know. So it would adapt, that was the first kind of introduction. And then um, friends, I have mentors and I think that's very important. And I, we kind of talk about that before, but um, mm. I have composers in LA older composers who would be my mentors and I learned a lot from them um, asking them about like agents and percentages and so the real world sort of stuff that we'd have, have yeah. coffee when I'd, we'd meet up um, then through an agent so I have an agent so I learned a lot through her as well her and him there's two of them but most of it I have to say is your own uh, investigations like online um, seminars like even later on today I'm doing Uh, I'm attending a seminar on publishing just mm -hmm. to kind of really get into, I recently became a publisher as well. So it's, a, there's a lot of online seminars now we're lucky, especially during the pandemic. So much stuff has come online for free, which has been amazing. So I'd say a lot of it is actually, you just have to get your own head around it and yeah. um, learn yourself. Wow. So I, I think, and, and I just, you know, just, just for the view out is like, I, like you mentioned like a lot of different skill sets right and and that can be sometimes very overwhelming especially when you mm -hmm. come into the industry as as a pure artist as a, as a creator you you, you want to express yourself and um sometimes it, it feels like a little bit too much almost like you know mm -hmm. suddenly people tell you oh you need to have your social media upkeep you need to have your reel you need to have a website you need to have a portfolio you need to have this and that you need to make connections blah 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 And I, 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 I see that, like, especially working with new artists together, there are a lot of times, you know, like situations where people feel very overwhelmed. Um, mm, yes. But I think, I think it's also important to mention those skills that you acquired, you did not acquire them within three months or six months because exactly. you, you, you are professional for how many years now? What would you say? When, when would you... It's taken a while. I mean, really, really professional. Uh, I started this 10 years ago, this journey, mm -hmm. but I did a PhD in other things. You know, it was like a slow, and this was only the last five years that's really, really become the professional level. Yeah. Um, and you're exactly right. It takes time and not to get, and I think, you know, the first thing, I mean, that's when you're saying the first thing to do is really write music first that's mm -hmm. all to focus on because obviously you've got had to have something to actually yeah. show so i think that's the first thing is just go away and just write the music first and then pick up all the other skills yeah yeah we mm. um i i i like to always to compare it with you know if you before you invite people into your house just make sure you have a nice house right and and that house and music Very is true right is, yes. uh, those are your products are your songs your compositions your productions your voice yep. um right i i and i and i think a lot of artists like to shortcut that process they you know they have done a couple of you know a couple of works and and um they spend a little bit of time on stage and now they kind of like okay now i want to go pro you know and now i want to yeah. make money how do i do that but they <laughs> yeah. haven't developed they haven't strengthened the house. The foundation is not there yet, right? And yeah. I think before you branch out and want to go pro, make sure that you actually have the backbone to do that. Know your theory skills, you know, you know your production skills, know your singing skills, whatever it is that you're doing, graphic design, whatever, whatever field you're working on. But it, there's no point in marketing and there's really no point in, in networking, right? When, when people actually are interested in you and then see your work and it's, it's not up to standard. So I think that's, that's yes. also important, hey? I think you hit it straight away. It is, it's like, you've got exactly, you've got to have your product. You got to have who you are kind of, and I'm thinking how I, I'm thinking back how I started. I mean, it starts very small, doesn't it? It's really small. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I started in piano bar. So, you know, yeah. I was a piano bar singer, but I tell you, like, you know, I look back then I was like, I don't know why I, I, I did it. because I just love singing and performing, but that really was the best training ground because talking about music theory you know mm -hmm. that my improvisational skills um my uh, understanding of harmonic language that's just all developed without me even knowing it really that i was mm -hmm. setting a foundation 
So I think yeah. that's exactly what you said is starting kind of get your house in order and starting small, but having that foundation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how did you, how did you get into music in the first place? You said you started with, with piano. <laughs> Was that your first, your first point of, of your connection with music or how, how did your journey musically start? It started pretty much as a kid. It would have been like the traditional, like, you know, I do come from a musical family, as you know, my brother as well, um, you know, definitely was a musical family. So I started just the, the traditional learning the piano at nine and singing in choirs as a kid. I did all my music theory. So I, did, I was pretty, pretty focused on music, mm -hmm. but, and did music for my um, VCE. Yeah. as well so I did music for that but I also did sciences as well so I that was a big that was you know and we talk about these kind of the, the choices that we make you know I had the choice to do composition then when I was 18 at VCE or you know I did the sciences or I could have done like so basically my parents were like you know get a real job first, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, get, which I think for me, this is just for me, was actually good advice. But I, what I would say is that depends what job you get. So I went and did osteopathy, became an osteopath. Wow. Um, which was, a, yeah, which was, which for people who don't know, it's, it's in the kind of physiotherapy, chiropractic world of manual medicine. So, you know, and I loved it. It was, it really did that part of my brain, you know, really, mm -hmm. um, Uh, work that part of my brain but what I what I was happy about it is that I could work the hours I wanted to work mm -hmm. when I wanted to work and that is the key I think if you end up doing a nine-to-five job it's pretty hard then to try and build a musical career um, so I started off as an osteopath but at the same time I started doing I don't know how I felt I, I was doing weddings for friends and then it just built into piano bar and I don't know, it's one of those weird things. I wanted to do music, but I wasn't sure where I fit. I fit. Where mm -hmm. was I? Was I a singer or songwriter? Was I a composer? Was I like an orchestral composer? What was I? So I started doing piano bar. That was the first kind of real performance composition that I started to do some of my own stuff as well. How so old were you then? Piano bar. Sorry? How old, how old were you then when you started piano? The piano, piano bar? Bass? Yeah. Uh, I would say probably mid-20s. Mm-hmm mid 20s because osteopathy was a five-year course so yeah, oh no wow. sorry i started during no no i was sorry mm -hmm. I, i started at uni so I was about mm -hmm. 20 yeah i did a few gigs at the university bandura rmit open week <laughs> open week orientation week that's where i first started so and then i moved to ireland started working here and then i started to do the piano bar at jazz clubs collaborated with some singers um and then I started writing more of my own things. And then a friend of mine was doing, said to me, hey, I'm doing this uh, master's here in Ireland, in Dublin, called uh, Music and Media Technologies. And basically mm -hmm. it's composition, but it's a lot of music technology, which was what I was lacking. I was like, I'm, I'm writing all this stuff. I've got the music theory. I've got the musicianship, but I want to record. I want to know mm -hmm. sound engineering. I want to know a door such as logic. Yeah. So it's, but it was a master's, which was great, two years master's. So I got into that, which was amazing. And that's in Trinity College, really beautiful old, old university. So that's where my actual composition journey started. So it was a really <laughs> convoluted, interesting way to get mm. there. But, you know, every step of the way has been important. Yeah, of So I'd course. say for people out there, like you think, you think you're going, you want to go that way and you end up going that way, but that path is just as important to get you where you want to go because of the things you learn. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure you've learned a lot of skills uh, from being an osteopath that you can transfer to music, right? Are there connection points? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's really good that you said that because being an osteopath, you know, I was pretty young, you know, and looking after people, you, you have to get a confident quite quickly mm -hmm. because you're dealing with people's health and you, you, It's big responsibility. So mm -hmm. I kind of, um, my, what do you call it? Social interactions were built and mm -hmm. learned very quickly. And it's inter interesting how I was talking to, there's a, a well-known composer called um, Christopher Young, and mm -hmm. he did the music for Sinister, mm -hmm. Hellraiser, all that sort of thing. And he's, he, would, he would have been one like mentor for me when I was in LA. And I remember he said to me, you know, 
this place would have eaten you alive if you came here in your twenties, <laughs> in your mid twenties. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. He, he was like, "It's actually better if you have a bit of life experience before to going mm-hmm. to LA because it's it's the industry, you know." Yeah. So I was like, "Wow!" I thought I'd wasted that time being, in some ways, wasted that time being an osteopath, but I don't think I did. I think it mm-hmm. gave me a lot of backbone and skills of dealing with people and interacting with people because I do see I mean I lecture as well in um, composing uh, film film students uh, in film composition and you do I see some of them that are so young and they're talented they're amazing but you know you just need a bit of experience to get out into especially for film the film industry I'd say it's the same for like you know singer songwriter world as well would you say Mm -hmm. I, th- I think confidence is more important than talent. And I think life yeah. experience is more important than ego. And I yeah. think both you can only really get with time. So I agree. It's, it's very rare that you have young artists who, are, who don't have a big ego or need to overcompensate and have enough life experience. Usually the, the people who, who get famous really young or really successful really young, they went through a lot of shit in their life beforehand yes. and they had yeah. to grow up really fast. Um, they have this tenacity and they have also kind of, they can disengage from their own ego and, and know what to do at certain mm-hmm. points. But usually it takes time and it's right. It's really it shortcut does. certain things. There's no, you're absolutely, there's no shortcuts. And I think, the people out there, if they're listening at the very beginning, I think just to remember that it's like, a, I always think of it like a ladder. Mm-hmm. Every step of the ladder is important and, yeah. and you can't skip ladder. You can't skip steps because it will bite you back <laughs> later in life if you try and skip the important steps. Yeah. Um, and, and that's patience. Uh, you just need patience and belief. And, and it's interesting how, like, you, you know, it's life experience. And I totally agree with you. Confidence is a big thing being a, a person that people can relate to and mm-hmm. like to hang out with is a really important thing because especially when you're in a collaborative environment such as film, which is hugely collaborative, you know, you are working in stressful environments with these people very closely mm-hmm. and you just have to have those skills, those personality skills. And it's interesting how when I have met some of the really very well-known composers who've been at this for years, mm-hmm. the most well-known ones, and most of them are anyway, but they're really humble. That's what I really, it really struck me. They are super, Crazy, super eh? humble. Yeah. yeah. I remember Almost when I was, like, oh. yeah. Yes, I, I, remember, I remember when I was, um, I think I might, might have been like 17 or 18 and I just moved to, to, to Berlin. I grew up in like a small town in Northern Germany and, and then I moved to Berlin um, and, and became a session musician as uh, especially for bass and, me and my friends, we we got a really big job like for an Australian band at that time, and we um, we had the pleasure to work with one of the producers of U2 together. Um, oh wow! On, on this on this project, and he he came over from 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 Britain or from Ireland, or so, Maybe so, Ireland somewhere there. Yeah, yeah somewhere there. <laughs> and and um, so it was like three months, and he at that it was still the time where like you know major label had a lot of money so he basically flew every morning from from britain over to berlin and in the evening he flew back yeah because he yeah he wanted to he always wanted to be there um for his for his daughters and bring her to bed that was really important for him right wow so we started fairly early and um but what i really liked like in the studio we had maybe like a crew of maybe 20 25 people it was very big studio and um on the second day when he came in, he knew everyone by name and he knew something yeah. about it. So he came in, there was a janitor, he talked to the janitor, um, you know, the, the cleaning lady, the, 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 the chef and so on. And it took him like half an hour to actually get to the studio. But it was like for me, like a 17 years old, like how does he know that? I'm, and because we've been practicing like for like three or four weeks in the studio before he even came in, right? And it's like, I don't, I don't know those people. And it was just so beautiful mm. that he was, and he gave everyone the opportunity to chip in. There was never like this, um, oh yeah, look, it's me. Like you do what I say. Like I literally played something on the bass and then I stopped and he looked at me and said, what, what do you think? Did you like that one? And I was like, are you, why are you asking me? <laughs> you know, like, I, I don't know what do you think? And it was just such a humbling experience that it was always about, well, look, I'm an enabler. 
I am here mm. to bring everyone together and like, I'm not important. I just enable everyone to do their best job. And that was just, the, that was probably my first real connection to, you know, to a professional producer in that sense that I, you know, where world-class producer really been just such an amazing connector. And that, that yes. showed me really the, 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 you know, the signs of communication really, really bluntly. It was just a beautiful, beautiful experience, you know. And it's nice because it's like he's genuine. I think being genuine and having integrity mm-hmm. is so important, you know, and, it, mm-hmm. and that's what keeps you in the, for the, the long run is yeah. being a good person. And I think like, like him knowing everyone's name, you know, that he just yeah. values each person for who they are themselves. And I think in our industry, you know, there is, there can be, unfortunately, you know, this superficiality that, you know, goes on. But I, I have to say it's, it's the ones that are humble, have integrity and really care about everyone. They're there for the years and years and years. Yeah. And, and they have this amazing reputation and people love working with them. If yeah. you have an ego, I mean, definitely in film, obviously certain, <laughs> there is ego obviously there, but like for, for the music side of things, I came across very little ego in the orchestral world. Definitely. It was just, everyone was just there to do a job. They were good at their job. They were good people. Um, and a pleasure to work with. Of course. I mean, the- it makes sense. Right. I mean, in, even in the, in the professional world, if I have the chance to work with someone that I like and does a good job or someone that's a complete asshole, but is an excellent musician, I would always, yes. always choose the one that does a good job. Because I can train yeah. him, I can talk to him, right? So, yep. and 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 I find like whenever I produced like in the past like uh, bands or acts um, that were maybe they had like a one num- number one hit or something, and they were like on cloud eleven, you know, but were f- still fairly young, and those were the most assholey people. But like <laughs> you know, but like people mm-hmm. like you know, uh, yet really established artists who are doing and you know, it's the same for you. They don't. They can't afford an ego. I think this, especially now, you can't afford having an ego because it yeah. is. It is about connection. And if I don't like someone, and if we don't like people, we will. We would never work with them. Period. Right. Exactly. You're exactly so, right. That's the, definitely like you know. I mean, I've had obviously I work with orchestral musicians, you know, yeah. and record. And I'm the same as you. There's certain musicians that I'm like, they were amazing, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't ask them again because they were just they were they were just difficult. Yeah. And, and I would rather someone who maybe doesn't have the same skill level, mm-hmm. um, but I but I work with them and they try hard and we can communicate yeah. and then they get something, some emotion in the music that maybe the other person can't yeah. because they don't have the same connection. Totally agree with you. I, I've yeah. definitely, like I said, I have my group of musicians that I work for and I, mm-hmm. so that I, I get to do the music for me mm-hmm. and record and they're the loveliest people. We, yeah. We're friends. I think that's the thing. You become friends with these people. And yeah. the directors I've worked with, you know, there's been many over the years and they're all friends of all, you know, very rarely, maybe one or two that was difficult, but you always find some way to kind of wait, make it work. Um, but they're all lovely, you know, and people have asked me, like, have you had any bad experiences? And I'm like, not really with directors because, like you said, you just would, you don't end up working together if you don't click. You just, that's it. You don't even go that way to work yeah. together. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, um, so let's, let's, let's continue with your, with your bi- <laughs> biography a little bit. So you were 20, you were starting to become an RCO. Um, then after that, you, you, um, you studied um, engineering, some kind of like in a music engineering field, technology field. How did you then go from there to now, you know, working all over the world and, and like how, can you guide us a little bit through the steps? What happened in your life from then to now? Together. Basically? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's quite it's funny. I never well, first of all, I never thought this would actually be my life. I didn't. Mm-hmm. It's one of those things, you know. Again, it's it's taking step by step. You know, mm-hmm. have a plan to a point, but I kind of just followed my nose my intuition a lot of the time. So I did this, um, the masters. So with the masters that I did, it's it, they, the wonderful thing about it, which I haven't, that's why I wanted to do it. I loved it. Hadn't come across a masters that blended music technology, the sound engineering, everything, but with composition, orchestral mm-hmm. composition. So we did uh, recording. We did, we did programming. We did C++. We did crazy stuff, wow. you know, electronics, like really it was quite full on amazing course. But we also did orchestration. 
mm-hmm. learning about all the different orchestral instruments, proper compositional um, uh, theory, you know, oral training, you know, playing piano, singing in different clefs, different lines, like amazing stuff. So it was an, I was very fortunate to have had the opportunity to be here at that time mm-hmm. to do the course. So that opened up a world in to concert music. So I actually started writing music for the concert hall. So, for example, like the National Concert Hall, we I became part of a group of the Irish Composers Collective, which mm-hmm. is still going now. And we were put in, uh, put a, um, we get funding from the Irish um, Arts Council and put on concerts, but we'd use the professional musicians here that would work in all the levels, but they would put on our, so we learned a lot. It was almost kind of like mm-hmm. you ended up workshopping your own pieces. So I did wow. like crazy stuff for like quintets and eight piece choirs and, but within a professional setting with professional musicians. So again, a really good uh, initiative that, that was. So I started off in concert music, mm-hmm. but I always loved, and again, just kind of fell into it. Like I, I always loved film music. And in particular, for me, what I did really love about film music was more the independent, the indie films. So mm-hmm. the film that really struck me, and I always talk about it, when I was a teenager, I watched this film called The Piano. Mm-hmm. And it had music by Michael Nyman. I don't know if you know it at all. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Um, it was in the 93 or 4 or 5, somewhere around there, mid-90s. Very crazy remember, movie. Oh, cra- <laughs> amazing. The music, I remember the music. Just, I came out of that going in tears, just going, something happened there. Something changed my life. But it didn't happen until years later that I understood what that moment was as a teenager because it pushed me towards a particular style of music that I now write and into film. I always had that passion about it. So I started kind of, oh, that's how I started. Sorry. So that's, that's how now I'm remembering now how, how it went into film. So I'd finished this master's. Yeah. And a friend of mine who I'd sung at his wedding. So this is all the connections, you know, wow. because I was singing at weddings. I was singing at weddings, doing piano bar. And he was um, up in the north in Belfast. And two years after I sang at his wedding and, and he became a film director mm-hmm. and he called me and he's like, I'd like you to do the music for my film. Mm-hmm. I was like, I've never done film before. And, you know, are you sure you want me? And he's like, yep, yep, definitely. That's how it actually started. And that's when I drew from that passion that I remembered that film that I loved and what it did for me emotionally. And so I wrote the music for his film. And then I'm like, this is you know, it went really well. Um, did about two or th- two or three of his just short so, films. So, so wait a minute. So, let me interject that. So, the the reason why, what was the reason why he wanted to work with you? Again, like we talk, it's it's that he heard my music. He knew yeah. that I, you know, that I played and I wrote stuff. But the connection, it's the connection mm. that he 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 not at first. I think there has to be. He has to I have to like the music. So he liked my mm. music, but because we were friends I did Mm -hmm. and you know I really went out for his wedding I mean this is the whole thing you wouldn't think that you know um you know he asked me to do a few songs but I did loads more than he even asked for at his wedding Mm -hmm. because I I wanted to I enjoyed it so it's but because he saw that input I think he was like I really want to work with you because you really got into this and yeah Mm -hmm. I think there's something in that so I think that's another thing in everything you do even if it's putting out the garbage, whatever, do it really well. Yeah. Do it really well because you don't know who's going to see that and, and who might think, hey, that person did that job really, really well. I trust them to do mm-hmm. something bigger in the future. So that's how it started, which is really yeah. interesting, isn't it? Um, the connection. So he, so I did a couple, but, I had, but it, the timing was good because I just finished that master's or was halfway mm-hmm. through it, I think. So I'd already had some of the skills, the technology skills to be able to do a yeah. film yeah. and record and whatever. And then I was like, I really, this, this was amazing. I really felt this was my genre and my platform that I could express my musicality um, in a different way to the concert hall. You mm-hmm. know, the concert hall is great, but I felt it wasn't, I wanted to just do something more melodic, more harmonic, whereas the new music scene here can, is a little bit more academic, let's just say, yep. um, which is fine too. I still, you know, do that as well. Um, and then there was, gosh, I have to remember, then in Ireland they had this masterclass of, mm. a, of um, who now I'm friends with, this guy who used to organise masterclasses between LA and Dublin. 
So they oh, yeah. bring out Los Angeles composers to do a masterclass for people interested in film music. Yeah. Just, again, amazing. So I went to one of those and the guy who did it was a game music called Gary Scheiman. And he did, uh, he's the Bioshock. Mm-hmm. He wrote Bioshock and Dante's Inferno and many others. Amazing composer. Oh, amazing. He's an amazing composer and has become a very good friend now. Like, so this is how it works again, relationships. So he did the course. He, I did the masterclass for a weekend here in Dublin and it was all subsidized. It was very like uh, Ireland's quite good at subsidizing further education mm-hmm. workshops in the music, in the arts world. So I did that. And you know what? And this is another thing I'd say to people. I'm quite shy. I actually am shy. Like I found it really hard to kind of just talk in front really? of people. Not anymore. I think I've learned I mean, to, yeah. yeah, but back then. And I, and I was like, I really want to ask him. I really want to ask him about his music. And I did for the first time ever, I went up to him and I spoke to him and I so glad, I'm so glad I did because he was like, you should come to LA, come to LA Whoa. and, and come and do film scoring. So, and so course, um, that moment when you, before you asked him, what went through your head that made you decide to actually go, go and, and, and talk to someone that you admire, what went through your head there? I think it's the whole idea of now or never, mm. you know, now or never, because he's that, that you, when, when, I'm, when, I'm, when will I ever see him again? But it, there's, in talking about the psychology of it, and I know where, where you're very into that as well, the fear, overcoming the fear of looking stupid, rejection, mm-hmm. or, um, or freezing, you know, being that kind of frozen state it was this whole kind of emotional change within me of like okay I've got to overcome this and just now or never and overcome the fear of mm-hmm. stepping out it's stepping out of your comfort zone really isn't it of, of risking something yeah absolutely and I and that's something I've taken with my life now it's just constantly risking something all the time and it's scary but it's where things happen. It's that edge of risk. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know, risk is also opportunity, right? It, opportunity never happens yeah. by itself, right? Exactly. Crazy. Crazy. And, and so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, and so, so he then, invited them to, to, to work in LA or to come to LA. Yeah, well, to kind of come to LA and to, you know, and so, but I still wasn't there yet. I was like, oh, yeah, it's a bit scary, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the, the universe, the universe started to push me a bit more, I think. <laughs> Yeah, gotcha, uh, gotcha. I was like, oh yeah, no, nah, no, nah, that's just too scary, and I mm-hmm. don't have the money, and all that sort of stuff. And then about six months later, there was another masterclass of another composer, Christopher Young, mm. <laughs> and he came over and he did film, and the same thing. I and he actually did an amazing thing. He listened to everyone's music, so we had a one-on-one to him with him. Wow, which is really very. Again, I believe you know the things come at the time that they're meant to come. So and of how, course bad, I had... how bad was your music when you listened to it? <laughs> but you know, that was the great thing was like the whole thing. I had my house in order because I've, yeah. I've, I've done the kind of the masters, thank goodness. So I had all these pieces because of all the concert music, gotcha. you know. You so prepared. I was lucky even still nowhere near to the level, you know, I've learned a lot since then. But he listened to my music and he was like, yeah, you know, this music's I'm not sure if it's film music, he said, but it's something there because it was more concert music. It was more mm-hmm. kind of um, minimalist and which yeah. is funny because it's my style now. Anyway, but anyway, so he was like, you know what? You should come to LA. <laughs> he said the same thing, come to LA. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got a house that I rent out to people on a reduced level mm-hmm. uh, for people like you who are coming over. You can stay Holy in shit. How did, how did that make you feel? You were like freaked out you know <laughs> this is the second person it's like the second sign <laughs> whoa that's crazy and, that's crazy and that's crazy and then so after that i was like gosh you know they've got two guys who are willing to kind of you know help me out i've got a place to stay for at least four months mm. um but i still had no money <laughs> i still had no money to to the, so i looked out to look into it and i'm like okay let's seriously look at la and mm-hmm. You know the costs of going to UCLA or USC. There's there's two or th- there's about two main schools in LA. Mm-hmm. Uh, one's public and one's private. The private's super expensive, which is USC for, for us Australians anyway, um, Irish Australians. And then 
the other UCLA was um, a public school. Mm-hmm. Still, still is very expensive. So, and this is the third push, I think, that the universe gave me, you know, I was still umming and ahhing. So there's a, I don't know in Australia if you know, there's a scholarship called the Fulbright Scholarship. So it's okay, basically, it. it's a big American scholarship actually yeah. to, for anyone outside of America to come and study in America. Yep. Pretty hard to get, really well known. And again, I saw it and I was doing a, oh yeah, I went on and was starting a PhD. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just threw that in. Uh, I was doing a PhD at the time. <laughs> on interactive media audio stuff that's sure. another story another story that's the gaming side how i got into gaming um but i got an email about this fulbright scholarship and again i was like oh no that's too hard i won't even bother applying for that you know mm-hmm. it's too competitive um because it would give me the money to go to la mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then a friend of mine applied and i was like well if she's applying hang on a second why should i doubt myself <laughs> why do I doubt this thing we doubt ourselves don't we like oh no I can't do that That, that's you know and I applied and I went had an interview and would you believe I got it (laughs) and off I went to LA that was it that was the start of my film scoring career it was just mad (laughs) that is mad that is mad it's all it's all these little I again now I look back and I'm like wow the universe or whatever you want to say was just dropping little things and it's I think the thing is, is to be open to everything. Mm-hmm. I think there was many things, especially the PhD. I didn't even want to do a PhD, mm-hmm. but it was the PhD that helped me get, uh, because you have to be enrolled in a PhD to get the Fulbright. Ah, oh, gotcha. Or, you know, so, but I, that wasn't my plan. So I did the PhD because they were like, hey, you did great work in the masters, the masters I did. There's a gaming company that's doing some research that needs some sound design. Mm-hmm um would you want to would you like to do that but i again freaked out going i don't know anything about sound design i don't know how i'm gonna have to yeah. figure this out but it was paid <laughs> so i was like okay well okay hey, I'll <laughs> chance my arm <laughs> it's paid i'll do it that's how i fell into that had no clue no clue found my feet there fake mm. it fake it till you make it but then that opened the fulbright then went to then opened the doors so what i would say to people is i didn't want to do a mobile game based on mobile gaming i was like i I have no interest in that but Mm -hmm. you know i did it anyway because i thought i might learn something i'll learn something that might be extrapolated to some other area and was is that is that you know and is that is that a conscious decision from you was it always a conscious decision to say like no i i whenever doors open i just go through it and i value it later or is that is that more in hindsight now that you realize okay well actually I just have that ability to just go. What do you think it is? I think I I think I did uh, have that ability, <clears throat> yeah. but it was it was a it was like a muscle that you kind of oh, yeah. exercise because the more doors you try and mm-hmm. you think, oh wow, that worked out well. Okay, I'll try the next door. So it became I became more confident in uh, being okay with failure yes. if it didn't work. You know? Yes, failure is, is uh, it's it's this big myth around failure, right? I mean. There's really just either learning or or succeeding, right? I mean, this failure is really, I mean, everything yeah. that you didn't work out wasn't was really important for you to learn from, right? Be- yeah. That really enabled your success, right? And um, not to be and not to be scared of it. I think we fear failure. I mean, we we really fear a lot of us fear failure. I think and and what it does to our ego and. And I think that's where the, that's the making of you is in the failure. It's how you get back up or how you, you recover or how you, what do you learn from it? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, I, th- I think it's yeah. never really failure that we fear. I think is it's humili- you know, being humiliated in front yes. of your group. Right. Yeah. I, th- I think if you have yeah. a group around you, a really good group that loves you and that supports you, you, I, I don't think you can be afraid of failure because you know like that, that your value is not dependent on a certain outcome. Um, yeah. You know, so for, for me, like I, I never feel that I fail because I, I have a loving community around me that, that love that I try, right? And, mm-hmm. and, and I think that's, that's really important. You know, failure usually comes from a scarcity mindset. It comes from being you know needing to feel protected or protecting yourself from others or from others opinions and so on but you know if you have a good group around it doesn't matter what other people think you know 
So it's your tribe, isn't it? It's your herd. Who's your tribe that you're... Well, I mean, don't, mm. I, would you agree that every, every successful person by any metrics, really, if it's, if it's successful in, in business or successful in personal life, they have just a successful group around them? Right? I think so. I, I mean, you, so. you can't, you can't any, achieve anything meaningful by yourself. You can't, you can't uh, create a family by yourself. Period. Like yeah. you, you have to have other people, right? Even even going to the grocery store, you can't do that alone because people brought the food there. They they you know uh, put it on the shelves. They produced it. All of so we already live in this interconnected world all the time. We just usually don't see it. But if you really acknowledge that that you are in a community, and now that you have the the the, the power to actually create a community, that enables everything because you are securely attached because people value who you are not for what you do and what you fuck up right yeah. And, yeah and i think if you have that it makes it makes life just really beautiful because you know like okay well even in worst case scenario even if you lose everything material you have you have always people to fall back to you know exactly mm. and i think the thing it's hard and, and you know i actually made when i came back from la i actually made a conscious decision to distance myself from certain people Mm -hmm. I actually made that because I realized that not that they were, you know, it was a bad thing, but they weren't aligned energetically what I needed, you mm -hmm. know? And I think that's a hard thing, you know, when you, when you have to, you realize that you, <laughs> what is it? I, I follow Kerwin Ray mm -hmm. and the Australian guy, and he talks about the herd and it's so true. It's like, you know, I, I was with one certain herd and I remember people kind of saying, oh, don't do that. Or, you know, that's a bit, mm, a bit risky or, <laughs> you know, you shouldn't, you really want to do that. That's wasting time. And, and you look at the other herd and they're like, hang on, they're running and having a great time over there, you know, and it's, and you do sometimes, unfortunately have to shift herds. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I did. I kind of plucked myself out of one, still stayed friends with some of the people and cared and popped in. But now it's like, I'm on a different path now and that's my herd over there that I'm running with at the moment. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a hard one. You have to have a bit of sense of not being afraid of some isolation, mm -hmm. some backlash to your choices as well. I mean, I don't know if people talk a lot about that in the arts as well. Yeah. Cause we do get it and being female get it more being female let's talk so, a little bit about that because i feel that you're quite passionate about that and to be honest like mm. when we talked about pre pre-interview about it i never really thought about it much because mm. i'm a male and i'm white and i'm caucasian like i don't have globally speaking like no problems you know I, <laughs> I i don't look like a victim i never had really problems based on how i look or anything maybe if the two's about but But how is it? How is it being in the industry as a woman? Is there a difference? And if so, what and why? It's a good question. I mean, I never knew. And again, maybe because I'm a little, maybe I'm quite blinkered when I, I'm quite focused when I get focused on things. I kind of just go for it, and I mm -hmm. don't see the sides. I don't know if it's my upbringing because my mum's a very strong, strong lady. I come from a female, a family of strong women. Mm -hmm. But I never realized that being a female was something until, so, you know, not an issue potentially until someone mentioned it. And it was in LA actually, like, I mm -hmm. didn't really notice it so much here, but I do remember, you know, people would just, I'd go to film festivals and people would just assume that I was an actress, <laughs> you know, and I'd be like, okay. no, I'm a co composer. And they'd be like, never met a female composer. I've never met a, you know, didn't even know they were out there. And I was like, really? So it's funny how I didn't know it was an issue until someone actually brought it to my attention. And then I did, I have, I do, I have seen things and now I'm, my eyes are more open to it that, yeah, being female brings its challenges. But I, I always try to look at the positive too, you know, but it brings its uh, benefits as well. For example, if you're a female in the industry, they remember you more, you're more likely to be memorable mm. uh, because you're female. Because there's a lot of guys that, you know, people, They all look the same. There's a huge amount of competition. At least, you know, you will be recognized. Mm -hmm. And there's some female elements that I think bring something different to the table as well. Mm -hmm. Just our femininity, whatever that is, just something different, I think. So there's, there's pros and cons. Um, 
It is, it can be an issue. I mean, I, I just think, you know, there's a different view. Like even when I started doing, you know, getting into the music more and more, even academically, like I remember like starting my PhD being asked, do you really want to do a PhD? Don't you want to have children? <laughs> I, yeah, I yeah. actually had someone say that to me and I was like, what? If I was, what? Like, what does that have to do with anything? You know, mm -hmm. it's just coming. So you, unfortunately, you know, you do come across this as a female, things that guys obviously never would. Um, things like, you know, oh, why are you going back to do a master's? Shouldn't you just settle down and, you know, do work and have a family or whatever? Why go back and do a master's? Why, you know, and it's funny, some of those people who are kind of, I call them, naysayers just from their not in a bad way but just from their own conditioning i think yeah yeah now they're just like my biggest kind of supporters and fans or whatever if you want to call it it's quite funny but if i'd listened to that back then you know what what great loss that would have been you know so so women come with a lot more i think anyway i felt a bit more pressure than if i was a male of well, why are you doing this you know be sure you want to do this Whereas I'm yeah. not sure, maybe guys would as well. I don't know. Um, but it felt like yeah, I, had, I had to kind of overcome a little bit of not negativity, but just doubt. That would be the word, doubt. Can mm. she do it? And then when I kind of have achieved a level of success, you know, they're delighted for me. So it's quite funny, isn't it? It's, it's always a full circle, right? If people don't understand what you're doing and why you're doing it, it's usually first they ignore you, then they try to prohibit you because it makes their own life look very bad because they're not going for what what you're doing right yeah and and then the last step is then actually acknowledgement before that so you that's why it's so tricky to listen to other people that are not mm. in your tribe right people in your tribe would never say that right but people outside of your tribe and of course we're social species so we always like we always still like to you know consider other people and and their opinions But yeah. knowing, knowing, okay, well, if people are not on your side, it's not necessarily because they don't like you or they don't want it, but they don't understand it and they're afraid of themselves, how it makes them look, mm -hmm. the level of success mm -hmm. that, you, that you're aiming for. And, but, you know, in the long run, people don't care enough or people yeah. still love you in the end of the day and they just want you to be happy and they had no idea what you're actually doing. You know? yeah. <laughs> so I, I always tell my clients, look, make a list, like, A4, A3, or A5, and put the names on there of people's opinion that you really value. Um, mm. You know, like your mentor, like you know your teachers, your parents, if they, you know, if if they have a good track record of actually supporting you, good friends and stuff like that. And if they something, take it on board. And everyone else that's on the list, they don't have the they don't have the right to to influence your emotions based on what they're saying because they don't know you, they don't care for you, they don't love you, they don't want to see you succeed. You know, so why yes. would you take that on? All right. So having a good list. Brilliant. It's, uh, and I think what you do, what, you, what you're doing in the mentoring is so important because psychology is so important and mindset is so important. Mm. And I think what, you, what your, your approach is, is really, really important. And we mm. don't value that enough, I think, in the industry is the mindset. Because I'm thinking, you know, if you listen to these things, it gets into your subconscious and then it, it drives different behaviors, you know, and you have to be very careful. I mean, I'm even learning still now to be careful what my thoughts are, what, what I let in, what I don't let in. I mean, yeah. Chris Young, we said to me he, that he has this, he says, you'll have this little person on your shoulder that will just be saying these negative things. And da, 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 da. he says, you have to learn to just pick them up and put them down for a while <laughs> and just <laughs> not listen to them. <laughs> just put them down yeah. for a while. And then after a while, they'll probably be back on your shoulder. And, you know, blah, blah. So uh, I think exactly what you said, I think your mindset is so important. And then being female, what I am careful of, like, is not to think of that as an issue. You know, I don't, you know, when I go into a situation, I'm just like, I'm a composer. I'm just a composer. Whether I'm male, female, doesn't matter. And it, I ignore, I ignore anything in my brain that's going, oh, did they say that because I'm a woman? Oh, no, no, no. You know, you just, just don't go there. You know, for me, I just like just do the job, go in there and ignore any of that sort of messages or behavior that is in the industry. Because it is, it's there. It's, it's a cultural societal thing. It's not going to go away for a long time. And it's going to mm. take time to change. So you just have to ignore it and focus on the music. I think as a, for all my female, the females out there, I'd say just, ignore it 
and just power on forward and, and do the job. Do you have like you know, special group like with female composers or something? Are you do you, are you organizing yourself in any other way or do you just not care? Do you just do do you? Um, I I am part of like um like there is like the Alliance of Women in Film. Of mm. Alliance of Women Female Composers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, film composers. Anyway, AWFC. And then there's the uh, um, Women in Film and Television mm -hmm. that I am a part of. So I think I have definitely found that tribe really great, yep. female creatives. Um, and they're just, it's just nice having that community because we're all, we're just champing, you know what? It's, we're just champing and championing each other. Yep. Uh, that's what I, but, you know, and I have, friends that are female composers but we don't talk about it too much we actually don't we just we actually talk more about the work yep. what we're doing and but but definitely it's nice to have those organizations that are all they're doing is really highlighting the issue and trying to say to directors producers there are really talented female composers you know have mm -hmm. a look at their work you know consider talking to a female yeah um And I think that's what their role is. So that's all we can do. And my, my role, I feel, is just to help. So, for example, like I have to say I do like, the, um, you know, I have a female sound engineer that I, I, I use for the orchestral recordings. I have females around me and males as well, mm -hmm. but I try and have a good balance. Yeah. Because there's a lot of women out there just as good as the guys and they're just not being seen. They just, mm -hmm. It's just a visibility thing. So that's my contribution, I think. And then helping anyone who wants to contact me who's female mm -hmm. to get advice. Yeah. Very good. But I don't think about, I think it's important not to think about it too much or make it too much of your identity. It's always about the music yeah. in, in whatever we do, isn't it? It's always about just creating. Totally. Um, mm -hmm. Let's switch gears a little bit. I would love to just bluntly ask you, how do you make money as a composer? <laughs> like what, what are your income streams? Like what? what How do you live from making music? How does that work? Well, I think it's, it's, it's hard, as hard as all the music industries, I think, isn't it? It's So money-wise, like I have only recently, to be honest, just like recently, maybe eight months ago, mm -hmm. stopped being an osteopath completely. Mm -hmm. Like I was doing a bit of osteo here and there, not very much, just kind of keeping, it was a kind of a bit of loyalty to some of my old patients who have had for the last 10 years. I felt a bit yeah. bad and sad to leave them. Um, but also it was nice just to have a bit of cash here and there. So I, I that's why I say to people, there's nothing wrong with having a day job. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with doing something that supplements your creativity. It's, it's okay. I think there's this um, almost a sh a shame around oh I have to do another job because I'm not earning enough in music but I think that's totally fine you know mm -hmm. um, and I say to my students as well it might be good just to have something that you enjoy on the side that gives you a bit of money but gives you that doesn't suck up all your time from yeah. the music um, so money wise so with for film composing you know royalties are important things so obviously I get paid to do um, and this is where the whole business stuff comes in so I, I get paid to do a score Yeah. But payment depends on how much you get paid depends on so many things. It's like, is it a sync license? Is it a total buyout? Is it a work for hire? There's all these different contracts mm -hmm. that give you leverage. So for example, a sync license, which I do a lot of, is that I write the music, mm -hmm. but I keep it to use. So they're basically uh, syncing, paying a license to use it for a year They're, rent, they're renting it, basically, the music. Exactly. But you still That's have exactly. the rights for it. Yeah. Mm. You still have the rights for it. So somebody else can use it for some for a commercial or something else. So that's a sync license. Um, but then there's a total buyout, which is more for gaming. They keep your music. Everything. Yeah. That's so, it. But, It's theirs. And you get no royalties for gaming, unfortunately. But for that, the buyout is ideally a little bit higher than the sync license. Probably, exactly. and that's yeah. where you need to know to ask for more for total buyer and it's okay to accept less for a sync license because mm -hmm. your music's going to be making money later as, as you know um but royalties is a big thing like with singer songwriters mm -hmm. and song placements you know so i just did a, a really big um i just finished a really big project i was saying 100 minutes 100 minutes of music which was intense um but it's like that's sync licensed so then you have to make sure that everything and this is the whole business part that everything is documented they call them cue sheets mm -hmm. so cue sheets so every bit of music is 
put into a document and what uh, PRO, which is your professional rights organization. Mm -hmm. I think it's, um, is it APRA in Australia? APRA, APRA in Australia, yeah. Yeah, so I'm IMRA and there's ASCAP. I'm with ASCAP, which is American as well. Mm -hmm. So all this sort of thing, you have to make sure that that's correct. And then you have to make sure that everyone has copies of it, that it's in the PRO, that the producer has it, that the broadcaster has it. Um, and then you have to keep an eye on these royalties as they come in. But then that's just your writer share. You can get a publishing share as well. Um, so I don't want to, I probably won't go too much into it because it is a little bit complicated. So you can become mm -hmm. a publisher and you get even more money. Mm -hmm. from that pie of money that comes in from royalties so royalties that's where you have to be especially for film because we are a visual medium so all of our stuff ends up on tv mm -hmm. commercials um so you make you know some money is made through i mean commercials so i actually did a national a a nab bank ad yeah last yeah. year even before <laughs> so commercials are great money they are yeah. really great they and is that typically a buyout for commercial oh. you well i got a sync which was i was really surprised yeah. mm, because the money sync. was really good i got a sync mm -hmm. license and royalties so that piece of music could be used in any commercial anywhere else in mm -hmm. the world um i'm not sure usually usually it's sync say for single songwriters and things like that it would be sync yeah. license but with more conditions that you can't use it for say for five years anywhere else um yeah. some piece but and so you've got that commercials are a really good revenue they're mm -hmm. harder to get though because mm -hmm. the competition is very fierce and also the turnaround is very quick so for that i got a call at five o'clock in the afternoon have you got yeah. a piece that goes with this visual i had to yeah. run home stay up all night <laughs> write write something um and then within three days boom deal done you know that's how fast Crazy. it is yeah yeah and we, i mean i had to do some corrections and um edits and stuff that they requested mm -hmm. but but you know so it's a tougher intense kind of world commercial world mm -hmm. but it pays dividends it really does yeah, um yeah. then you have trailers that pays very well as well so that's hollywood trailers for films or tv shows because a lot of people don't realize a lot of the time the trailers are not the music of the composer who did the film no oh, i have no idea yeah really a different excellent yeah, yeah. good to know there are to actual know. trailer companies production yeah. companies who just do trailers and they sometimes have editors who put different stems of of music together and create their own trailer like mm. I don't, I don't, you know obviously you know stems you know so it could be stems yeah, from yeah. all different types of music they're usually the ones that are very sound designy and very you know yeah. um and so there's these trailer companies. Uh, Two Steps from Hell is a well-known trailer mm -hmm. writing uh, duo. So a lot of the time, that's and they pay crazy money. Like I haven't, I've got, I've got, I've got one trailer here, but didn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't like a Hollywood trailer. But the Hollywood trailers are very, very lucrative mm -hmm. if you can get it again. Highly, highly intense, highly yeah. competitive. Same sort of thing. We need it by tomorrow, and you have to stay up all night <laughs> and write wow. the music. Um, so there's trailers, uh, film, obviously, mm -hmm. gaming. Um, what else have I, if I missed anything? There's animation. Animation pays quite well. Um, so really it's like through sick, there's, there's many different revenues. There's also, if you want to put out CDs of your music, soundtracks. Mm -hmm. Soundtracks used to make more money as with everything. Now I think it's more of just um, an advertising tool, but you do get some income from that. Um, what else is there? A lot of composers also lecture. I mean, mm -hmm. I lecture. A lot of composers do workshops on your, on our down, downtime. It's a bit of, yes, it is making money, but it's also giving back to the community mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So I do lecture. I do workshops um, for emerging composers. But it's still in the same world, at least, mm -hmm. of the music world. So yeah. that's about it. I'm trying to think any other way we make money. I think that's about it. Well, you, you don't perform good. anymore. TV. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do I perform? No, I wish I had more time. The only problem being a composer is, um, which I'm trying to kind of not let that happen, is you end up not having the time to play your instrument mm -hmm. as much. Uh, yes. So I try and have 15 minutes a day. I play cello as well. Yeah. So to do cello and piano. Um, but no, I don't perform anymore. But maybe, maybe a friend, a friend, an electronic musician and myself, we're doing an album at the moment which maybe end of next year when 
COVID situation's better, we probably would look at performing that live, which would be fun. Nice. But Very no, there's no time. We're just sitting in front of a keyboard pressing buttons <laughs> for hours on end. Exactly. Probably an electronic an one, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> lots and lots of um, we work in MIDI a lot and scores and but then then you have the the joy of I had an orchestral session mm -hmm. uh, four weeks ago which I actually got to record a full wow. day of, of strings for this this documentary and TV that I series that I did. Now yeah. that just every you never get bored of that. That's amazing. Mm. Cool. Awesome. Let's slowly come to an end, but before we do that, I would love to ask you some quick questions, maybe like Ooh. one or two sentences or even even just words. Let's say I um someone, let's say Elise, Elise is 18 and she has written some songs and she likes she likes composing, she likes making music, and she comes to you or she writes your DM on, on Instagram or whatever, and she asks you, Hey, look, I want to be a professional. Um, what do you think my next steps should be? What would you say, let's say, the next three steps for an emerging composer to work towards a professional career? Is a film composer? Film composer, game composer. Okay. The next three steps, and she's a singer-songwriter background. Yeah, yeah, she writes songs mainly, but she, mm. you know, she plays maybe a classical instrument even. Okay. Something. Well, there's a couple of things I'd say. So three things. One, you, you, it's training. You do need mm -hmm. training. No matter where, what background, film is a different, it's just a different industry to sing a songwriter world. Uh, you have to learn to read the scene. Mm -hmm. You have to learn to kind of understand picture and how to write music for picture. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. And that can be, you could, yes, there's the more expensive you know, courses in LA, which are the, the proper training, but there's a lot of online classes like Berkeley has a lot of online cl classes that go for three months. Um, so training, training either, you know, through education, um, in, which is Berkeley or online or actually going to, you know, I'm actually starting to run next year in August, um, summer, one month long film scoring with a colleague of mine, um, mm. film scoring, classes with people from LA they're coming over and we're going to do like an intensive and I think an intensive is really exciting because you know people don't have time you know they don't have money they don't have time it'd be nice to give them a month intensive to get them started yeah. Yeah. so something like that would be number one number two uh, try and find number two festivals <laughs> networking just meet a whole bunch of people like and again small stuff like I when I first came back to Ireland from LA, you know, I had all my connections in LA. I didn't know anyone. I didn't know anyone in film in Ireland, like zero. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I, everything was, was done in LA. So I came here and I, I saw that there's a film network Ireland had Christmas drinks. It was just local group of people who like to make films, you know? And I went to their Christmas drinks. And just from that, I got like eight short films, eight wow. short films. Within that, obviously, you know, came over the next year or mm -hmm. year or eighteen months. So very small stuff like that. Like you know, look at people who are at the same level as you. I mm -hmm. think you know you can't go to, I uh, know Steven Spielberg, you know, and say, hey, <laughs> can I be your next composer? You know, so kind of like start start at your level. Yep. You know, which is going to be the indie filmmakers, the short films. The, so so number one, training. Number two, networking. And number three, mentorship. Mm -hmm. find someone maybe again someone who has time like again you're not going to go to you know Hans Zimmer or someone like that because they are too busy they're just too busy to mentor or have the time so find someone who is maybe like me more kind of more the emerging composer getting into the professional world mm -hmm. um, or someone like that just to have coffee with mentorship ask questions um, to get you onto that path so I think those three things if you have those three you're on your way. Great. That's, uh, that's very, very helpful. Um, next question. What are the three things that you use in your profession the most? What are the three items, the three technological uh, things, the three books, tools in any shapes or form? What would, they, what would that be? The, 
Most three things would be, first of all, definitely, I mean, we can go like as specific as my, my logic and MIDI keyboard. That's my life. <laughs> Pretty much yeah. logic is my life. So logic so, is the software that you record with. Yes. With. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's one of those. There's, there's digital performer, there's Cubase um, as well, but I use logic. Mm -hmm. Logic, number one. Uh, number two that I definitely need is my microphones <laughs> for mm -hmm. recording, the Peluso. I use a Peluso, which is a kind of a, a remake of the Neumann mm -hmm. U87. That's the one I think, A, whatever. So it's, it's a lovely, so the microphone. Yeah. And then three would be, there's a book called Behind Bars and it's all about orchestral writing. Uh, mm -hmm. Not so much how to write because, you know, I, I do have that theory there, but it's to make sure the score is very clear for performers because that's one thing you have to be careful of. You need to know how to write a score because time is money in recording sessions. So for, especially in orchestral recording sessions. So if you have a score that's not clear or that takes time for performers to understand, you're losing time, losing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. money. Um, and losing how much material you can get recorded. So behind bars is the Bible for this. Basically, it just says put the dynamics here, put this here, put the you know. It's you know very very clear. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. That's great. Uh, next question: um, Do you make your bed in the morning, and why or why not? Mm, yes, I do because Jim Quick. I looked at Jim Quick. <laughs> He's someone I follow as well. I make it every, I have a routine in the morning. I make my bed, I exercise and have a cold shower. Mm. <laughs> well, hot and then cold at the end. They're my three things that I think I got from Jim Quick mm. just to get the brain, try and avoid looking at my phone for the first hour or two of work. Right. Um, yeah, and here. My, I think, I think that's a Jim Quick thing too. I think discipline and being slightly regimented is needed for creatives, which we don't always like. It's not really in our nature sometimes, but it does help, I think. It does, because, you know, because it, uh, everything you need to do consciously creates, you need willpower. It's a very finite resource. So by the time you actually need to be creative, you're already exhausted because you had to make so many choices and things. So. Interesting. I never thought mm. of that, actually. Yeah. yeah. So I think, yeah, so definitely make your bed. <laughs> make it. <laughs> <laughs> and the last question. Um, before I let you go, I, I've definitely occupied a lot of your time today. Thank no, you so much. No, it's been lovely. Um, imagine that all of the work that you have done has vanished. All of all the records you have produced, all the scoring, no movies have come out, and but you have that experience in your head, and it's it's also your last, the last five minutes of you on this planet, and you want to give something that you have learned to the next generation but it has to fit fit on a post-it note what <laughs> what sentence was what words what would you put on there that is your legacy what would you tell the next generation what would you tell your loved ones what would you say mm. i think be tenacious be i think tenacious. that would be mm. What does that mean? Sort of just never give up. Never give up. Be tenacious of like, you know, just keep pushing forward. Keep pushing. You fall down, get back up, keep pushing forward. It's grit. It's, you know, just tenacity. I love that word, tenacity. There's just, there's something that it's not aggressive, but it's just steady moving forward or moving move no sometimes not even moving forward sometimes moving backwards <laughs> sideways but mm -hmm. you just keep moving keep moving so be tenacious in whatever you do great final words thank you so much uh, <laughs> natasha for taking for taking the time for us and i just want to oh, acknowledge you for not only taking the time but also learning the skills sharing the skills applying the skills never giving up when it was hard but also trusting in universe god whatever yeah. whatever you believe in that whatever happens it's always a part of learning and a part of growing up and i can't wait to see new scores new music of you and i'll link yeah. everything um down in the, in the bottom all your contact details and everything so that people can talk to you um if they have any further questions thank you so much Natasha, for today uh, and thank you very much
You're welcome. Pleasure. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank and you. for you guys, if you made it so far, that means that you're really serious about what you're doing, which is great. You are not the one that need a quick fix of three minutes and uh, you'll be a professional. So if you made it so far, you probably are tenacious. And uh, according to Natasha, that's what it means to be a professional. All right. So far for today. See you later. <laughs> Bye, guys.